Well, it's good to have you back with us today. Uh, we're back in class, as you know, on Saturday mornings at 9 o'clock, but I understand some of you have things going on, so you're continuing to do it this way, do your confirmation classes this way, and that's fine. I uh, definitely don't have a problem with that as long as I get your assignments in so I can uh, give you credit for having done those. Uh, but I do uh, appreciate being in person so we can have conversations, talk about questions where you have them, and uh, just uh, I think it's a better learning environment for you in person. A uh, reminder about youth group. Uh, this past Tuesday night, we had a really good meeting. We had uh, 13 people at our youth group, and I look forward to uh, that continuing to grow and continuing to uh, move forward as we uh, do these things, as we uh, plan uh, activities and what have you. And uh, turn off my phone here so it's not going off while we're in the middle of this. But uh, we've got uh, some different things we're looking at doing, going out and uh, doing some service work here in the community, picking up trash, maybe some other types of things. Uh, also uh, looking at moving, uh, going to Luther Homa this summer, uh, the, the uh, Lutheran summer camp, and uh, hopefully, be in, hopefully involve you in that as well. But uh, also we have the escape room coming up. We're doing uh, some trivia and uh, doing some trivia sessions and youth group to get you prepared for that because the way you get out of that uh, room, the way you escape from it is through uh, doing uh, answering trivia questions and you have to answer them correctly to get out. Uh, but uh, then there's a ropes course I want to take you to to uh, help you uh, come together better as a group and work towards that. So uh, I have all these things going on. And uh, of course for eighth graders, we're moving up closely to uh, their first communion on Monday, Thursday. And then also uh, being conf uh, full confirmation uh, this summer, so or in June. So uh, we have a lot of stuff going on. But today we're back in the Lord's Prayer, uh, the fourth and fifth petitions. We've done the uh, introduction and first, second, and third petitions. So uh, today we look at the fourth and fifth petitions. The fourth one is give us this day our daily bread. And the fifth one is forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. So let's take time to pray, and then we'll dig into these two petitions. O oh God, you give daily bread to all people, those sinful, even without prayer. But we ask in this prayer that you will help us to realize this and to receive our daily bread with thanks. Since our daily bread includes everything needed for this life, we thank you for such things as food and clothing, home and property, work and income, a devoted family, an orderly community, good government, favorable weather, peace, health, a good name, and true friends. And then, Lord, you taught us in the fifth petition, and we ask this, that you would not hold our sins against us because of, and because of them refuse to hear our prayer. We pray that you would give us everything by grace, dear Lord, for we sin every day, and we deserve nothing but punishment. Help us on our part heartily to forgive and gladly to do good to those who sin against us. We pray this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. So that brings us to the Lord's Prayer, the fourth and fifth petitions. The fourth petition. Give us this day our daily bread. Well, what does this mean? What this means is that God gives daily bread to everyone without our prayers, even to evil people, even to those who are not believers, because we are all his creation. But we pray in this petition that God would lead us to realize this and to receive our bread with thanksgiving, and thus we put a greater reliance upon him rather than ourselves. What does daily bread include? Everything. Everything you need to live. Food, drink, clothing, shoes, house, family, land, animals, money, goods, a husband or wife, parents. The list just goes on and on. Everything in this world is a gift from God who is our creator. What happens if God takes away our daily bread? Very simple. We die. So we pray for this, and we know that God is providing even before and even when we don't pray. But we do pray that God provides. And in that prayer that God provides, we pray that we will grow 
to better know him and to better respect him and to rely more upon him. I said, why does God provide? He provides because he is our creator. He provides all the gifts mentioned in the first article. Do you remember the first article? Hopefully you're not forgetting these things as we go forward because you do have an exam coming up at the end of, uh, or fairly soon about this. But let's take a look at that first article once again. And that is on page, uh, let's see here. Go back to the first article in your catechism. Hopefully you have your catechism handy. And, uh, and the Bible, because we're going to be looking in the Bible today as well. But the first article, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. So what does this mean? It means that God made me and all creatures, that he has given my body and soul, eyes, ears, and all my members, my reason, my senses, and still takes care of them. This is on page 133. What else does he do for us as our creator? He gives us clothing, shoes, food, drink, house, and home. All those things that are mentioned in the what is meant by daily bread under the fourth petition on page 258 in your catechisms. And why does he do this? It says he does this out of fatherly love, divine goodness, and mercy. Without merit or worthiness in me, he does it freely for us. Daily bread. All the necessities of life. Because we are his creation. Matthew chapter 5 verse 45. This is, comes out of the Sermon on the Mount. Remember in the book of Matthew, Jesus is teaching chapters 5, 6, and 7. Those are the Sermon on the Mount. And Jesus says in this, he says, God makes his sun rise on the evil and the good. He sends rain on the just and on the unjust. And why would he do this if they don't believe in him or they don't understand him or they don't want to walk with him? He does it so that they will turn to him, so that they will come to him and understand where everything, where their life actually comes from. We're on page 259 in your, in your catechisms. And you might turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 6, and uh, particularly verses uh, 10, pardon me, verses 11 and 12. Well, those are the verses where we find this fourth and fifth petition. So, page 259, or pardon me, 260 in your, in your catechism. If God provides all this stuff and he does it freely, then why do we need to pray? If he's going to give it to us, why do we need to even pray to him and ask for it? Well, it's because we humble ourselves before our God. We place him in the position he should be in as our God, as our creator, and thus we respect him. As it says in the fourth petition, in the, in the fourth commandment, honor thy father and thy mother, but as you know, that includes all authority. We say, do it because of the first article of the creed. Are you starting to see how all these things tie together in your lives? So we pray in humility for what we need each day to live, and we do it with the assurance that God is already providing. We pray in humility for what we need, and we do it with thanksgiving. Because without him, we would not have these things. And we pray in humility for what we need, that it would provide contentment for us. That we would be satisfied with what God gives to us. Because it's when we start questioning what God gives to us, and start thinking that, well, I want this, that, and the other thing. God's not giving it to me, so I have to go get it myself. When we start doing that, that is when we start sinning. Because we turn away from God, and these other things start taking on an idol, an idol type appearance. A uh, idolatry attitude. Matthew chapter 6, verse 26. It's a beautiful verse. It says, look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? You know, this is Jesus teaching, and yes, we are much more valuable than they. We are the crown of God's creation. So if he's going to provide for these lesser animals, certainly he provides for us. How does God provide for us then? Question 273 on page 261. If, if God's going to provide for us, then how does he do that? 
He doesn't go to the grocery store for us. It doesn't just appear in our cabinets. But he makes it, he provides for us through his creation. He makes the earth fruitful, grains and vegetables and fruits, animals to feed on the grasses. He blesses us with the ability to work and enjoy the earth's fruitfulness, the opportunity to work. If we are, if we, this is important to understand. He gives us the ability to work. And when we deny that ability, when we say, I'm not working, I don't want to work, I'm tired of working, I can go down to the welfare office and get it. But what we're doing then is negating one of God's blessings to us. Now, yes, as we get older, or, or maybe we have a sickness or something that prevents us from working, but that's for another reason. God takes that, and as sickness is, understand, God does not make us sick. God does not. His, his, it wasn't God's intention that we would age and not be able to work. That came about through sin. But for those who can't work, whether it be because of illness or because of age, God provides to others so that they can share, so that they can do God's work. So you see, everybody has a place in God's kingdom. There's a and throughout all of it, even through illness, good is done. The other thing God does, how he provides for us, is he gives to us earthly authorities, our governments, which provide structure for us and opportunities where we can work and thus earn and receive our daily bread. Psalm 145 is such a beautiful psalm. It says, the eyes of all look to you and you give them their food at the proper time. You open your hand and satisfy the desires of every living thing. Every living thing. That was a bird from the previous slide. Now we're talking about every living thing God provides for. Because he is our creator. He provides our daily bread. As I said, you know, and as you, you're well aware of it, there's some who lack. There are some who do not have what they need. Uh, Garfield County, any place from 25 to 35 percent of the children in Garfield County on any given day don't know if they're going to have food to eat or not. And this isn't God's doing. This is a result of the fall of creation. This is a result of what happened through sin with Adam and Eve. Therefore, God provides that we may share. Hebrews chapter 13, you don't need to turn there, but Hebrews chapter 13, verse 16 states this. It says, Do not neglect to do good and to share what you have, for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. So when we look at these things and we say, Well, they've got so much more than I've got. Why don't I have what they have? There's a reason. It's so that they can learn to do the work of God on earth thereby expanding his kingdom. I have, so I will provide. And hopefully someday you'll have, and then you can provide. Passing the good deed forward. Give us this day our daily bread. In some way, shape, or form, God gives it to us. And maybe we don't like the way he gives it to us. And what I mean by that is, you know, some of us have a pride about us. And maybe we lose our job. Maybe we get fired from a job or laid off. Lord knows a number of people have been laid off because of COVID. But there are places and ways to get food. He provides through the government, the WIC card, W-I-C, where you can go to the grocery store and get groceries. He provides places like loaves and fishes here in town or our daily bread across from St. Xavier, St. Francis Church downtown, so that you can get, so that you can go there and be fed. God provides. Before we go to the fifth detention, I think it's interesting to, to bring this up to you. And I'm not expecting you to learn Hebrew and Greek. Don't get me wrong. But I want you to think for a moment. What's the name of the city where Jesus was born? Mary and Joseph traveled to this city because Herod called for a census, a counting of all the people. 
so that he can make sure he's collecting the taxes that he's supposed to collect. So Mary and Joseph had to travel to Bethlehem, the place of Joseph's birth. And there she gives birth to Jesus. I just gave you the answer. The name of the city is Bethlehem. But do you know what that word means? I think it's so cool when we talk about this uh, fourth petition. Of course, the fourth petition is dealing with physical needs and what we need to survive. But it also points to spiritual needs. That's what's so cool. That word Bethlehem is a compound word in Hebrew. In Hebrew, the word is pronounced Beth Lechem. Beth Lechem. Beth, the first word, B-E-T-H. Lechem, the last part of it, L-E-H-E-M. Beth means house. Lechem means bread. The meaning of Bethlehem, what it means in English, is house of bread. Well, what's the house of bread about? Who's born there? Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, is born in Bethlehem. And what does Jesus tell us? In John, he goes through and he tells us in John chapter 6, John chapter 6, and let me get the correct verse for you. John chapter 6, verse 35, Jesus says, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever lives in me, who believes in me, shall never thirst. From the city named the house of bread, Bethlehem, comes Jesus, our Savior, who proclaims himself, I am the bread of life. I am saying he is God, bread of life. He provides for us. And how does he provide? Remember creation? All three parts of the Trinity were present and active. The Father spoke. The Son made it happen. The Spirit brings order to it. Jesus is the bread of life for us. Born in the house of Bethlehem. In the house of bread, the city of bread. Take time now and move over to the fifth petition. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Well, what does this mean? This means that we pray, and I'm on page 264 in your catechism. This is Matthew chapter 6, verse 12. But chap verse six, uh, chap page 64 in your catechism. What does it mean? We pray in this petition that our Father in heaven would not look at our sins or deny our prayer because of them. We are neither worthy of the things for which we pray, nor have we deserved them, but we ask that he would give them all to us by grace. For daily we sin much and surely deserve nothing but punishment. So we too will sincerely forgive and godly do good to those who sin against us. We do not earn our forgiveness we don't merit our forgiveness by doing good deeds. We're gifted our forgiveness through Jesus Christ dying on the cross for us. And thus, as he forgives our sins, we too should be forgiving of other people's sins. And thus we pray in Jesus' name that we may know forgiveness and in turn be forgiving. That's what this fifth petition is about. Page 264, question 276. What do we ask for in this petition? Very simple. We ask that our Father in heaven, for the sake of the Son, forgive our sins. And that is exactly what he does. He forgives our sins. In worship on Sunday mornings, we do the Kyrie. The full word, the, the full phrase here is Kyrie eleison. That's a Greek word. A Greek phrase, Kyrie eleison. And what it means in English is, have mercy on me, O Lord. Have mercy, O Lord. That's what God is. He is merciful. For the sake of the Son who covered himself with our sins, the Father has mercy on us and forgives our sins. 
Luke chapter 18, verse 13 says, O God, be merciful to me, for I am a sinner. And that we are. We're terrible sinners. We confess that every Sunday. Hopefully you confess it every day. That God, and ask God for forgiveness. In humility, in the state of humiliation, we get on our knees and beg our Lord. Father, I have sinned. Forgive me of my sins. And what's interesting is the words in the Bible that say God forgives us our sins. There's a Greek tense that shows that that happens continually forever. God forgives us our sins from the past, the present, and the future. Christ died for the sins of the past, the present, and the future. So we pray that he would have mercy on us. Psalm 51, verses 1 and 2, a confession of King David. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. And he does. But if he does this freely, then why do we need to ask it? It's the same as with giving our daily bread. It's humbling ourselves before him and understanding that we are who we are because of him. And without him, we are nothing. We need to pray for forgiveness of sin because we sin every day. And without forgiveness from God, we can't even expect God to hear and respond to us. Through praying, God frees us by giving us peace with God. By praying this, this petition, forgive us our sins as we forgive all those who forgive, those who trespass against us. We're acknowledging that God forgives us our sins, and therefore we too will be forgiven. Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Let me turn back to Psalm 32 for a moment. If you want to turn with me, you may. It's about halfway through your Bible, a little less than halfway through. But Psalm 32 in your Bibles, verses 1 through 5. Psalm 32, verses 1 through 5. And this is a psalm that King David wrote. Blessed is the one, this is what's on your screen there. Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. For when I kept silent, my bones wasted away, through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me, my strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. I acknowledged my sin to you, and I did not cover my iniquity. I said I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. And you forgave the iniquity of my sin. The great God we have. You can't hide your sins. He sees it. He knows everything. He knows your heart. He knows everything you do. But when you sin, he's already forgiving you for that sin because he knew you were going to do it. And here's where we might stop for a moment. There's different words for sin. And what is sin? Sin is an act, a thought, a deed thought, word, or deed against God Almighty that causes a separation from him. But in forgiveness, one for us by the cross, Jesus closes that separation. But there's different words that we use for sin. Sin, iniquity, transgression, debts, all these things, afflictions, all these things, all these words point to that one word, sin, and they all carry the same meaning. What is a sin? Something that separates us from God Almighty. We'll turn our page in our catechism. Page 266, verse 278. Why is forgiveness so important for us? Well, for one thing, without forgiveness, we die. We die in sin. Forgiveness grants us peace, grants us life. Forgiveness reminds us that we're not better than anyone else because everybody sins. And because we're forgiven of our sins, unconditionally by God Almighty, then we are enabled to forgive others. You know, Ephesians chapter 4 says, Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake forgives you. Just as God forgives you for the sake of the Son, you forgive other people. And we do it unconditionally as God says, as God does it for us. 
God doesn't says, I'll forgive you if you do this, that, and the other thing. God says you're forgiven. So we need to be forgiven. The forgiving of others in the same manner. The question often comes up then when we hear these, this fifth petition, forgive us as we forgive others. Does that mean that if we don't forgive others, God's not going to forgive us? No, it doesn't mean that. But it does mean that we're supposed to be forgiving. And the thing is, if we refuse to forgive, and, and, and this might be a little bit hard to understand, God forgives us whether we ask him for forgiveness or not. God forgives us whether we forgive others or not. What happens, though, is if we refuse to forgive others, then we reject the, God, the forgiveness that God offers us. It's being given. He doesn't withhold it. But we can certainly reject it. And that's what we do when we fail to forgive others. Thus, in Colossians, we hear St. Paul write, Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have. Forgive as the Lord forgave you, meaning unconditionally. It's unfortunate. One of the, in so many cases, one of the least forgiving places tends to be the church. Somebody does something wrong and we accuse them, we bring them down. Boy, I can't believe you're still working here because you're doing this and did this wrong. What's wrong with you? How about a sense of forgiveness? Forgiveness is so important. Because in forgiveness, number one, we heal a relationship. That's what Jesus Christ did in his death. He healed the relationship with us, between us and God the Father. But when we forgive others, we heal that relationship as well. Now, they don't have to receive our forgiveness. And if they don't, then it's their problem, not yours. But you've offered forgiveness. The other thing forgiveness does is it gives you freedom. If somebody's done you wrong, and you fail to forgive them, every time you see them, every time you hear their name, every time they talk to you or whatever, Whatever reminds you of them, it's going to put it, make you great inside, kind of like you're rubbing your hands on sandpaper. It just hurts. When you forgive them, you release them. You release yourself of that power they have over you. And that sets you free, that you can be God's child and work towards forgiveness for others as well. Sometimes there's going to be those who don't forgive you. And we do as God said, to the, as Jesus said to his disciples, dust your feet off and go to the next town. We continue to pray for those people, that they would come to understand who God Almighty is. So, the fourth and fifth petitions. Give us this day our daily bread. What does this mean? It means that God gives us every single thing that we need. Without it, we die. And thus he is our creator, provides us with everything we need. The fifth petition, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive our those who trespass against us. What does it mean? It means that we are going to be forgiving creatures just as God forgives us. Ephesians chapter 4, it says, get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger. Brawling and slander along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another. Forgiving each other. Just as in Christ God forgave you. Forgiveness. It can be difficult to forgive at times. But I want to caution you on one point here. And it's, it's page 268 in your catechism. Question 280. You need to keep in mind that we live in a sin-filled world. So the question in question 280, the question 280 says, does forgiveness mean that I must forgive and forget? See, the Bible says God forgives us and our trespasses are wiped away. What about us who hear on earth? And, and the answer in your catechism is very true and very correct. Forgiveness does not mean having no memory of past wrongs. We ask our Father in heaven to 
free us from the anger and resentment that may accompany those memories. We relinquish them into his hands and trust him for healing over time. But I've counseled so many people who have been done wrong, who have been abused, both children and adults, primarily children in their teens and adult women who have been abused. Forgive, but don't forget. That may seem opposite of what Scripture says, but it's not. What I'm saying is, offer forgiveness, but learn from what got you into that position to begin with, so that you don't place yourself back in that position so important in this sin-filled world that we do so. And God will take care of you. After all, he's already forgiven you of the sins that you're already thinking about doing, and you don't even know you're going to do it tonight. But God forgives you. May God be with you and keep you. May you continue to grow in his word as we go through these classes. Know that I'm praying for you as we go through these classes, because as you grow closer and more dependent on God, I promise you Satan's watching. But our God is so much more powerful than anything Satan can put forth. May God keep you and protect you. It's in his name that we pray this day. Amen.